Hey, it's Clayton from HowToDrawComics.net. In this tutorial, you're going to learn how to draw the human head from the top-down front view. This is actually part of a larger class which is available on HowToDrawComics.net and Skillshare, and I've got links to both in the description below. But without further ado, let's jump straight into this. So we're going to start this out in pretty much the same way we would start out the regular front view. So this time we're going to be looking down on top of it. However, we're still starting out with a sphere and we're using that sphere to, to determine the positioning and the size of the head on the page. We're keeping it light and wispy, kind of rough. We've got a very sharp pencil and if you're working digitally, you've got a very small pencil brush, a pinpoint that you're working with basically. We're going to lay in the axes, running it through the top and out the bottom. We'll draw in the horizontal equator guideline that'll run around the belly of the sphere. And because we are drawing the head from the front view here, even though we're looking down on top of it, we're still going to want to try to make it as symmetrical on either side as possible. Okay, so these guidelines that we've laid in so far around the sphere, I mean, there's really only one of them besides the axes, that's determining the direction that the head is looking in already. Okay, so by step like number two or three, we figured out what direction the head is going to be looking in. So use these guidelines to establish the direction that your head is going to be looking in from the get-go, from the beginning. We'll lay in the center line now. That's going to run from the top of the sphere to the bottom. And then we'll chop off the sides of it. Now, because we are going to be looking down on top of the head here, uh, there's going to be some foreshortening that occurs. And that foreshortening is going to cause the head to narrow itself toward the bottom. Given that, as I cut off the sides, the side planes of my sphere, I'm going to somewhat describe those side planes to represent and describe that foreshortening that's going to be happening. Let me show you because uh, it's, it's going to be much easier to show you what I mean by that. As I lay in this curve here, where I'm going to flatten out the side planes, you'll notice that it's somewhat following the same trajectory as that angle I just placed in. Okay, so rather than having the side plane division run straight up and down the sphere, I've actually placed it in on an angle here. Okay, so that when I flatten it out, it's going to have that, that foreshortening, that perspective built into it. Now, the, the more I'm looking down on top of the head, the more dramatic that angle is going to be. Okay, so we'll do the same thing on this side. Now, what degree of angle should it be according to the view that I'm looking at the head on? There's, there's no mathematics that you really need to do for it. It's just about using your eye and your best judgment. And your best judgment will get more and more accurate and better and better. Uh, as you practice, because you know what practice does is it helps you to work out what's going well and what's not going well. So it's as much about getting better as it is ironing out the, the the bad aspects of your art that you're not liking, that isn't leading to the result that you're looking for. Now, one thing that helps me to capture symmetry sometimes is by looking at 
you know, the amount of space I've got on this side as opposed to this side. And so sometimes that's what I'm judging in order to decide how much I need to cut off of the sides of my sphere. Now, I've talked about that before, but it's worth just <clears throat> as a reminder to mention it. And then I'm going to erase away the sides of my sphere there. Okay. And you can see we've already got, I mean, we've potentially got a narrowing cranium. A cranium that's smaller toward the bottom than it is the top, which is the effect that we're looking for here with our top down, down representation of the front of the head. Okay, next up, we're going to drop the front of the face. Now, it's not just going to be the facial features themselves that are foreshortened, it's also going to be the face as well. And so we want to try to keep that in mind, knowing that the length from the brow to the chin is in fact going to be shorter in this view than it would be in the standard front view. Okay, because of course the chin's getting further away from us. So what I'm going to do is sit it about here. Okay, so that's where the base of the chin is going to be. Actually, let's sit it a little bit lower. I feel like it could be lower. And as, as I lay in the length of the face, I'm trying to really think about the basic forms that I'm dealing with. I'm trying to visualize it on the page, those block formations that we went over initially. Now, because we're looking at the head from above, the width of the chin is going to be shorter. Then as we lay in the jawline, there's a few interesting changes that end up occurring here. The corners of the jaw are going to raise, while the bottom edge of the jaw elongates down toward the chin. Okay, so there's a greater amount of space in this second edge below the corners of the jaw that's going to be applied. Okay, so remember that the bottom portion of the jaw elongates down toward the chin. The angle is also going to be pushed. Okay, so it's going to be narrowed. Okay, so the corners of the jaw are actually going to be narrower in terms of their placement and their width in comparison to one another. as opposed to the bottom-up view, where we would see the opposite effect occur, where they would actually widen. This is what makes drawing heads on dynamic angles so difficult, is to start with, you've got a fairly complex organic form already, and then trying to foreshorten and, and present that in different angles is, it's difficult to, to get your head around, no pun intended, but that's why we try to think about it in the most simplest terms possible, to make it easier to perceive, to make it easier to think about and, and to comprehend how these changes might appear on the page when we apply them. Okay, so we've got the jawline figured out there. Remember, okay, I want to I reiterate this to you. The key changes we're going to see when we're looking down on the head are a, 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 an extension of this area here, the edge between the corner of the jaw and the chin. It's also going to narrow out. And then we're also going to see a smaller distance between the corners of the jaw as it tapers further inward the jaw basically becomes smaller and pointier. It becomes triangular rather than square, which it would become if we were looking at it from below. And, you know, one way that you can think about this is if this is the jaw from the front view, 
Well, actually, uh, let's say that this is the jaw from the front view. Just going to draw something simple here. Let's say that that's the bottom of the jaw from the front view. Well, as we look down on it, uh, what's going to happen is this extension is going to occur. Right? And as we lift the head up, we see the opposite effect. We see a shallowing of the shape of the jaw. And eventually, if the head looks up far enough, uh, we're going to see an inverted representation of the jaw, where now it's instead pointing upward. So this is the way in which I think about it. Okay, so that's you can think of that as the jawline. Next, we'll go ahead and we'll divide the distance between the brow and the chin in half. Okay, so we're dividing this distance in half. Now, keep in mind that half here, it's not going to be there, right? Even though that would actually technically probably be half, but no, we need to foreshorten it. Okay, so where would the halfway point be if we were to apply foreshortening to that distance? Well, it'd be sitting a little lower. It'd be sitting about here. Okay, so that's about where the nose is going to be. And then we divide the distance between the nose line and the chin into thirds. Those thirds aren't going to be equal, though, as they appear to us. They're going to be foreshortened. And so the first third will have the greatest amount of space, while the bottom two-thirds are going to have an increasingly smaller amount of space. Okay, so again, they, they scale, they're scaling away from us, they're getting smaller as we get toward the bottom of the chin. Next up, we've got the eyes. Now, again, what we need to remember is that the eyes are going to sit at the halfway point between the top of the head, which would be about here, and the bottom of the chin. So where would that be if we were to apply foreshortening to that halfway point? Well, I would say it would be about here. This would be about where the eyes are going to sit. Okay, so I'm going to lay in a line, a very light line across there. And we'll just keep it straight because really the eyes are going to sit on a, on a flat plane, on the front, the front plane of the face, which is fairly flat actually. All right, cool. So we've got the eyes placed in. The brow is going to it's going to sit up here. It's actually sitting quite close to the eye line. We've already established where the brow is going to be. I'm just going to draw it in here so it's a little clearer. And then we've also got the positioning of the ears. Now you'll notice that they're going to be sitting fairly high up. Okay, so they're going to be around about here. Even though they would usually align, the bottom of the ear would usually align with the nose line, what we want to do is kind of draw a line up following the curve of the sphere in order to figure out where those ear position, positions are going to reside. Okay, so always remember the ears, they sit higher on the head when we're looking at it from above. The higher we are, the higher the ears are going to be on the head. Wonderful. Next up, Let's lay in those head planes. Now, I like laying in the head planes because they give us a, a basic three-dimensional look at, you know, what the geometry of the head consists of. Okay, 
So we'll quickly lay those in. Now we've go. We've we've got a basic head structure ready to roll. Uh, we'll lay in the the hairline here, which is going to run from the top of our flattened out side planes. into the middle of the cranium and you can see that we've actually we pulled it down following the curve of the sphere okay and so we've got a, a fairly well structured foreshortened head happening here now we might go and tweak the shape just a bit to fine tune it to make sure it's the way that we want it to be, it's the way that we want it to look. And we can just go over the top of the darker line. Remember, always keep your initial lines very, very light so that you can do that. So you can just go over the top later on, you know, and fix things up if needed, or polish and refine what you've already got there. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Finally, I'll, I'll add in the neck. And we'll just keep the neck very simple here. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Draw in the trapezius muscles on either side of the neck. Wonderful. So that is the basic construction of the top-down view of the head. Next up, let's lay in the facial features. We'll move this down a little bit, actually. And we could even make it a bit bigger. There we go. Okay, so, facial features. Let's start with the eyes. I'm going to loosely draw these in to begin with. Now, the eyes, in terms of their most simplest shape, you can think of them as like this, from the top-down front view. Okay? Angry. It's basically an angry eye. Okay, so you're going to have... This flattened out portion along the top, and then you're going to have the bottom of the eye running along the bottom open the bottom edge of the opening like so. Alright. So that's what I'm thinking about as I'm drawing in these eyes here. On a very simple level, anyway. So again, we've got the top here. And we've got the opening of the eye. And it's going to run right back up into the top here. And the reason for that is because this bottom eyelid, which we can see quite a lot of, is wrapping around the eyeball shape itself. Same on the opposite side. And rather than using a curved line to describe the shape of the eye, you know, try to keep them shape and uh, sorry, sharp and energetic. Okay, so I'm going to do that on both sides actually. So I kept this one a little bit too curved. You know, curved lines tend to come out a little bit more meek, and you don't want meek for your drawings. You want them nice and energetic. 
nice and sharp and vivid. Okay, so we've got the eyes there. Let's roughly sketch in the eyelashes. Just a basic shape for those eyelashes. Got a set running around the sides of the eye, a set running along the bottom, and a set running along the top as well. All right, we'll do the same thing on the opposite side here. Keep in mind the, si the size of the eyes as well, roughly speaking. The width of the head overall should be about five eye widths apart. And the distance between each eye should be one eye width. Mine are probably sitting a little too far apart here, actually, so I'm just going to cheat here, and I'm going to move them over just a, just a tiny bit. Sometimes, you know, eyes, they can just be a little bit off. If you're doing this traditionally, of course, you know, erase it and do it again if you need to. Um, yeah, that's that's sometimes a problem I end up with. Everyone has their own, you know, repetitive issues that crop up within their drawings that... Know, usually need to be addressed, or you at least need to keep an eye on them. All right, next we will lay in the eyebrows. Okay, and as I said before, they're going to be sitting right on top of the eye here. So we'll draw in our basic eyebrow shape. As I've said before, if you have trouble drawing the eyebrow shape, practice that for like a day. And I can tell you, you're not going to have any problems with the eyebrow shape after that. And I mean just focus on drawing the eyebrow shape. It's, it's about tackling it one component at a time. And you might not be a pro at drawing, eye, uh, at drawing the entire head, but you'll certainly be a pro at drawing eyebrows if you're focused on it for a while. Eventually, you know, you pull it all together, and before you know it, you're capable of drawing the entire head with ease. I would never say that the he drawing the head is easy. It's always going to have its challenges, but it should get easier with time and practice. We'll draw in our eyebrow furs. Rendering them out. Mixing up the distance and the space at which those eyebrow hairs are placed to give them a nice organic look. And then we'll lay in the iris and pupil. So the pupil and iris are going to be sitting closer to the eye here. Oh, the top of the eye, especially if they're look if we're looking down on it from above, and that head is looking at us. Okay, so the pupil is going to be sitting directly underneath that top eyelid. We'll draw in a little bit of a reflection happening. And we'll do the same thing in the opposite eye, sitting the pupil, and also the iris right up against the bottom of that top eyelid. All right. Next up, we'll draw in the nose. Now, we're not going to place in the entire bridge of the nose. We're only going to suggest it a little bit at the top there. We might even add in uh, some subtle folds, some subtle creases around the the middle of the brow, just to describe some of the muscles that are within that area. But let's lay in the nose. Now, we know that the nose is basically like a block. We were looking at it directly from the front. It would look something like this. Okay, but then when we're looking above it, what ends up happening is that 
we don't see this underside plane anymore. Instead, what we end up seeing, we were to represent it with the block here, is an inverted representation that hides that underside plane. So in a sense, you could think of the underside nose plane as the underside jaw plane because the same effects essentially end up happening. All right, and so what does that mean? Well, if our nose is going to be placed here, it means that it's going to extend beyond it. Okay, so it's going to pull down further toward the mouth. Of course, we want to be careful here. We don't want to pull it down too far. Otherwise, it'll make it look as though our character's nose is much longer than it should be. Okay, so I'm only going to move it, pull it down a little bit. And I'm going to keep the shape fairly simple to begin with, at least. And, you know, that's, that's all you really need. Just something that looks like that. We'll go around the lightly drawn in basic shape that we place down to define its positioning and tweak it, refine it, make it look more like a nose. Indicate the top of the nostrils there if we want to as well. And that's about it. Okay, so now it looks like looking down on top of the nose and again you can indicate the nose bridge if you want to it's a stylistic choice i like to keep it fairly light and not completely defined once again try to get your nose centered in the middle of the face mine probably isn't all that centered for being honest all right next up we've got the mouth now once again, because we're looking down on the mouth here, rather than it being straight across from one side to the other, there's going to be a downward bend in it. Okay. So with that in mind, I'll go ahead here. I'll just start with the middle of the mouth. I'll pull out the opening up toward the corners, which will sit up here. Now, remember that the width of the mouth is going to be positioned, or the corners of the mouth will be positioned in the middle of the eyes on either side. And so what we need to keep in mind here is that not only does the positioning on the vertical axis of the facial features shift according to the perspective, but also their width is affected. Okay, so if we take the middle of the eye here and we apply it in perspective as we bring that width down to meet the corners of the mouth, well, they're going to sit a little more inward. Okay, so the mouth will actually be narrower than it would otherwise appear if we were looking at the head directly from the front. Okay. So again, another important thing to keep in mind there. We'll lay in the top lip here, if we're able to see it at all, because that, you know, the top plane of the lip is just, it's going to be hidden more from this position. Then we've got the bottom lip here. We can see more of it, though. We'll define its outline ever so subtly. And I'll darken up the outline to define it further. But the corners of the mouth, of course, which we can bring down just a bit. Like so. And then we've also got a little bit of rendering that's going to happen underneath the mouth. That bottom underside plane. That leads into the chin, the top of the chin. 
and that just about does our, our main facial features that sit on the front plane of the head. Next up, we have got the ears. We're going to be looking more on top of the ears, of course, since we're observing the head from above. So I'll start with the outline of the ear, and then I'll draw in the inner frame of the ear at the top. And I'm going to try to present it as though it's, it's really curling in there to the ear. All right, we'll lead that down to the ear opening, place in the ear hole. And I'm even going to, I'm going to pull this inner cartilage out just a little bit further to describe the anatomy there correctly. Add the little indentation in there at the top. Wonderful. We'll do the same thing on the opposite side of the head. Outlining the shape of the ear first. Drawing in the inner frame. Pulling out the inner cartilage. Leading that down into the ear lobe. And then completing the ear opening, which will cover the ear hole. And thus completing the ear anatomy. So now what I'll do, since our facial features are pretty much sorted, is I'm going to go back around the outside of the face and define the jaw just that little bit more. Really try to perfect its shape a bit. And all that requires is just darkening up the outline over the top of that lighter draft drawing that we started out with. I'll go back around the top of the head here. I'll erase these off cuts, tightening the drawing up just a bit. And then we'll round out the top. I find that you know, even for professional artists, it's it's actually tough to, to get this rounded bit at the top of the skull to be completely symmetrical. Not everybody has an easy time doing it. It takes a bit of tweaking, a little bit of sketching in order to get it right. So just take your time to, to capture a nice shape for it. And I think that's, you know, a lot of the time what this is, especially in the beginning, is just taking the time to, to get it right, even though it's... You know, seemingly insignificant aspects of drawing the head. Okay, cool. And now let's define the neck a bit more and we can call this head example done. We'll keep the neck simple. It doesn't need a whole lot of anatomy defined in it today. It's not the main focus. Uh, what we can also add in is maybe a little bit of indication of anatomy around the eye socket area. And, and I guess the, the, the side walls of the nose, which kind of join onto the eye sockets. Usually I'll just indicate that with a line, maybe a doubled up line. It doesn't need, need a whole lot. We can also place in a line for the fold of the bottom eyelid against the eye socket. And that just about does it. 
Hey, I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and that you got a ton of value out of it. Once again, if you did, you can access the full class on howtodrawcomics.net and Skillshare. I've got links to both in the description below. All right, that's it from me. Until next time, keep drawing.